And so now we are going to uh, move on and, and transition into our Asian Studies talk. Um, and this will be um, taken by Associate Prof Rajesh Rai, as well as the team from the Asian Studies uh, Department. So over to you. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, and I would like to uh, welcome all of you to the Asian uh, Studies panel at the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Uh, I would also like to request my fellow panelists uh, to turn on their videos and not be too shy um, so that we can introduce ourselves to the students. Um, now, this uh, focus on Asia is it's, it's in many ways uh, unique uh, for any such program that exists around the world. So the College of Humanities and Sciences is perhaps the only college of its kind in the world to include Asian studies as part of its core curriculum. Uh, why, you may ask? Uh, really, there are three reasons I think we would like to highlight. Firstly, that inclusion is in many ways a recognition of Asia's centrality. Now, more than ever before, in global, political, economic, and social transformation. Second, it reflects that NUS graduates are overwhelmingly based in Asia. And indeed, if they are based elsewhere, their nuanced understanding of Asia and of Asian societies is a tremendous value, addit value addition to their future career trajectories. Finally, that inclusion is a testimony of the tremendous depth and breadth of Asian studies expertise that exists at NUS, uh, widely recognized uh, globally as unparalleled uh, in universities elsewhere. Now, with that background, allow me to introduce you to uh, the people who are on this panel uh, today. Uh, we have uh, Prof. Ong Chang Wei. I'm really happy to see you uh, uh, from Chinese studies. Um, Dr. Nurman Abdullah uh, from Malay studies. Uh, Professor Henrik Meyer Older from Japanese studies. Uh, Professor Irving Johnson from Southeast Asian studies, uh, recently back from sabbatical and thus looking younger than ever. Uh, and myself, Rajesh Rai, uh, from South Asian Studies Program. Uh, perhaps I can begin with uh, Prof. Ong Chang Wei and uh, asking him really uh, to reflect on why uh, one should study Chinese studies uh, at NUS and how one can go about it. Uh, and perhaps with that, Prof. Ong Chang Wei, you can take over. Thanks, Rajesh. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so sorry, I, I was uh, in and out and in using different link. So <laughs> I was I was here quite early, but yeah. So uh, it's okay. So um, yeah. So uh, so my name is Hong Chang Wei, and I teach uh in the Chinese department. And actually, one of the, our educational missions right, of our department is to help our students understand understand China in a global context. Uh, I mean, right, whether you like it or not, and unlike in our generations, uh, China will become a big part of your life. Uh, just think COVID-19, right? Whenever or not, the, I mean, whether or not the, the virus actually originated from China, I don't know, right? That's for, for the scientists to find out. What we do know is that, I mean, Wuhan is the place right, where the first known widespread uh, transmission occurred. So initially it was called Wuhan virus, and, and, but why we are calling it COVID-19 now? Right. Well, this is because the Chinese government has uh, staged a strong protest to help WHO to have the name change. And why did WHO agree to it? Then there must be many reasons, but I think we can't deny the fact that one of the reasons is because China is now powerful enough right, to have its influence kidney felt in the world politics. Right. So uh, indeed, right, one of the most important stories in the 21st century so is the rise of China. Well, we could, of course, study this phenomenon from the perspectives of economics, political science, international relations, so on and so forth. But without an intimate understanding of the language, culture, and history of China, uh, I think the knowledge will be very superficial. Right? So, so, and this is where our department could play, play a big part in your educations. 
we are especially well equipped and well positioned right, to help you make sense of China today and how it got here by pulling its historical, cultural and linguistic resources together and the challenges it faces when doing so. And for instance, Xi Jinping actually, Xi Jinping's regime right, is different from its predecessors in the sense that it believes that the rise of China could not be sustained without revitali uh, revitalizing traditional Chinese culture. But what do we mean by traditional Chinese culture? Right? Is there even such a thing? Right? So our department will help you gain insights into questions such as this, so as to better prepare you for understanding the world where China has become one of the most important uh, players. And many of you might have the wrong impression that a graduate of our department right, could only become a Chinese teacher. Right? Now, not to take anything away from the teaching profession, right? I highly respect it. But the fact is that our students are very employable across uh, many sectors. Uh, and the reason should be obvious. I was just having lunch right, with a former student of mine who is now with MINDEF, right, doing super secretive work that he can't uh, review much. But his daily job right, is to study China. He told me that his boss has told him that his division is keen to hire more of our graduates. The, the boss reasoning is simple, right? Is that the kind of international relations knowledge needed for the job right, could be obtained on the job. But an intimate knowledge of the history and culture of China, which is equally important for the job, can be acquired overnight, right? It requires intensive training for many years. So our department has, a, has in a way, right, helped to supply the best fit for this kind of job. And in many ways, our department is uh, very unique, right? It is the only uh, department in the entire NUS where the main teaching language is not English, right? Therefore, in order to do a major with us, you will have to be very good at Chinese, which means that you must be able to write the term papers or exams in Chinese. And we've offered two majors, Chinese studies and Chinese language. Chinese studies focuses on history, thought, and literature of both pre-modern and modern China, as well as overseas Chinese. Uh, Chinese language, on the other hand, is the study of the language itself, including its grammar, phonetics, right, the construction of the characters, so on and so forth, and translations. Right, but don't worry, right? If you think that uh, your Chinese is not good enough, uh, or this is not your cup of tea, right? We have enough very interesting in English modules that, that will allow you to do a minor with us without knowing, without knowing a word of Chinese. Right? In fact, over the years, we do have a few non-Chinese students who minor with us and they did very well. And also like both of our exposure modules, uh, CH and CL11-01-01E are taught in a so-called bilingual mode, right? we, which means that the lecturers will either lecture in Mandarin or in English. Right, it, it, it really depending on their mood. But students will have a choice to do everything in uh, English, including exams, papers, presentations, if they so choose. So as long as you understand uh, conversational Chinese, then you are eligible to take these modules. And there are also uh, other bilingual modules in the department, right, in, including the one that I will be teaching in the next semesters on Chinese pop music. Right? Courses like this are designed to help our students who have gone through at least 10 years of Chinese language education to reconnect with the language. Right? So come on, right? it's a waste on your thing, right? To, after spending at least 10 years learning Chinese, then only to Huan Ge Lao Si in the end. Right? So come to us right? and keep uh, your knowledge of the language alive, even you think that your Chinese is bad. And these courses, this course, bilingual courses will also help you, help to prepare you, right? If you choose to do a minor in translation studies with us. Right? The, trans, the, the, uh, the translation minor is very popular among our students. Uh, so that's all from me, and uh, feel free to let me know if you have any questions later. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Zhang Wei, and, and, and it's really quite admirable that you offer these bilingual modules. They must be very difficult to teach, and it requires a tremendous uh, expertise to be able to uh, cut through both these languages in, in preparing for them. Uh, perhaps now I, I can move on to uh, my other colleague, uh, Dr. Nurman Abdullah, who who we can perhaps start off by asking the question about the prominence of Islam and how integral this is uh, to the study of the Malay world. Right, thanks very much Rajesh for that. Um, so my name is Norman Abdullah. I'm from the Department of Malay Studies here in NUS. Um, and perhaps I can begin by just saying very broadly that we've oftentimes heard uh, about Islam in the news and on social media from various political leaders and you know Islam as it is presented to us uh, would have oftentimes been mired in some controversies over time um, oftentimes being characterized or represented and headlined quite simplistically 
and sometimes quite problematically as well. Uh, and in so doing, what it does is that it sort of omits the, the diversity of beliefs and, and practices in, in diverse Muslim societies around the world, including uh, the Malay world. So, but I think before I sort of continue, I think it's important to provide some context, some very brief context first. So uh, Islam is uh, a, a very uh, populous religion. It's a very popular religion as well. It's followed by, by more than 1.8 billion people worldwide. It's one of the fastest growing religion as well. And Asia is actually home to about 65% of the world's Muslims. Uh, in, in the Malay world where Indonesia is part of, uh, Indonesia is the world's most populous Muslim country uh, with more than 230 million adherents. But within Indonesia alone, you will find that you know, there, there are a, a range of different practices, different beliefs, you know, different traditions that have been subscribed to over time. Um, let me just give some clarity beforehand on what the department calls the Malay world. And we subscribe to a very broad definition of what the Malay world is. And so for us, it basically refers to uh, the Malay Indonesian archipelago consisting of Indonesia, of Malaysia, Brunei, Southern Thailand and Southern Philippines. But it also includes um, areas with Malay minorities as well. So that of course includes Singapore and countries to which the Malay diaspora had spread such as uh, Sri Lanka, Madagascar and South Africa. So it's a, it's a fairly broad definition in, in, in itself. In the department, when we study Islam, right, we are interested to actually demonstrate and show how Islam through history and in contemporary uh, societies, how Islam has shaped and structured these uh, societies in the Malay world uh, differently, right? And uh, one, uh, area in which we're interested to examine is to, to see the different trajectories, the different outcomes of Islam in these various contexts, right? So, so we examine these issues, but we also sort of examine and interrogate Islam as a lived religion as it is practiced at the everyday life level and um, how, you know, these various societies such as what does it mean to be Muslim in a society which defines itself as an Islamic society like Brunei, or in a multicultural secular society such as in Singapore, or even as you know, uh, grappling with Muslim minorities in in different parts of uh, of the Malay world. So, with that in mind, right, we study Islam not theologically, but you know, through the lens of various disciplines. Right, uh, we are a multidisciplinary department. I will go through that very shortly. Uh, but I think in that particular spirit, let me very briefly now segue to sketch out the, the sort of three broad objectives of the Malay Studies Department here in NUS. Right? One is to basically provide a, an in-depth understanding of the history, culture, as well as the social and political institutions of the Malays, including, of course, in this uh, regard, to look closely at Islam. Uh, two is to create some awareness and an understanding of the major processes and factors confronting Malays in responding to modernity. And uh, three, to cultivate a sort of critical and empathetic spirit. And that is in some ways to identify and diagnose and critically analyze issues by deploying relevant concepts and methodologies derived from a multidisciplinary angle, including the social sciences and uh, humanities. Uh, in that regard, we are a department that is multidisciplinary. We are comparative in nature. Uh, our faculty members are trained in these fields, which you can profit from. And we have a range of different modules that you can select from that uh, you can find on our website very easily. We have also included internships and field trips uh, as part of our module offerings. And just to uh, broadly end off, you know, my spiel here, to be a major in the Department of Malay Studies. Uh, you don't have to have Malay language requirement. What you only need to do is to read one uh, module in basic Malay at the Center of Language Studies, as well as to uh, subscribe to our exposure module for you to major in Malay Studies.
All right, so I'll be actually very happy to answer any questions that you may have at the end you know, of uh, our presentation. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Norman. I'm just going to share screen now. Uh, we have some slides here from uh, Japanese studies and from Southeast Asian studies and from us. Uh, so if you just give me a moment uh, to upload this. Um, okay, so hopefully you can see these slides. Uh, and perhaps I can uh, begin with uh, uh, Prof. Henrik uh, to really uh, tell us how, and this is probably a a question that many students uh, have in mind as they go into university. Uh, how is Japanese studies uh, coping with, uh, you know, COVID-19 and the kind of changes that it has ushered in our teaching uh, as a result of that? And, and with that, perhaps you can answer that and, and then go into Japanese studies uh, as a program, as a department. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Rajesh. Um, of course, the, the COVID situation puts every area of studies to a lot of challenges um, because what we do is we, as part of their studies, we want our pro students, of course, to go to Japan and to experience Japan in the country itself. And we are pretty sure that will all happen again. Um, at the same time, we have to say that we do not just study Japan in Japan itself, but also outside of Japan. And of course, we also make use of the technologies. Um, so what you see on the slide here is a picture of me taking students in December to Tokyo, right? I already have that done that for the last seven years, but of course I couldn't do that last year. However, I was very happy when the Japanese colleagues then offered and said, why don't we do this Fashion Japan program online? And first I thought that wouldn't be possible, but then later actually it worked out very well. And that's actually on the next slide, there's some statements by the students here. And you can see the different things that we can do even from Singapore in a Japanese studies module. And you see that it's much more than just learning about Japan. For example, the first student says, yes, we learned about shopping cultures, actually have an opportunity to compare our two cultures. So they learn, not, people learn not only about Japan, they also learn about their own cultures by comparing to another country. And then they said there was also the issue of working cultures. And working cultures over the internet is again a very different thing when you have to comp uh, basically collaborate virtually. Um, then the student says, what I learned was very valuable also to the field that she wants to work in later in public relations. Another student was forced to use her Japanese. And if you use Japanese in person to one and another, right, you can use your hands. Um, but doing all that virtually is actually much more difficult. So it was a Great challenge for the students, but they did very well and they were very happy to use their language. Um, and then they just enjoyed talking to students uh, from their own other countries. So we can do a lot of things and it's not just learning about Japan, it's actually learning through Japan. And that's what we do in the department. Next slide, please. Uh, so what we basically do at our objectives is, of course, we teach you about Japan and we teach you how to interpret Japan. And Japan is a very important country still for Singapore. There's a lot of Japanese companies here. A lot of Singaporean companies are dealing with Japan. Um, politically, Japan still plays an important role, of course, in Asia. So it's important that Japan, Singapore has people who understand Japan. And we, we force you to study Japanese. Um, we have people, but you can start from scratch. Um, and actually people progress very well through it, our students. And by the end of their studies, they feel pretty uh, assured about their language. And many of them have actually even gone to Japan and started their careers in Japanese companies in Japan. What we want to do though is also, Singapore I always say is a country with a relatively small country with a relatively short history. And, but it is important to understand large countries with long, complex histories. And Japan is a country in Asia that gives you that opportunity. And again, what you learn about that country, you can also apply to any other country, be that the UK, um, be that Germany, where I come from, or US, or other large countries around the world. Um, and of course, you can apply all this interdisciplinary thinking skills that you learn. You can do that for one country in a more sort of settled context, not just to the whole world. You can see how all this can be applied to one country. For example, when you work on environmental issues, you can see how Japan's environmental policy and everything comes together. Um, we provide you with 
intensive Japan immersion. If you can't do it in Japan for the, currently now, we will do this in Singapore for you. And then, of course, I think, and that's something that all the Asian Studies Department have here, we can offer you smaller classes. And in our departments, you can really get to know your lecturers and your fellow majors. Our fourth year classes are normally 15 students at least, at most, right? Um, and not like 50 in other departments. Here's basically what you can study. You can see we are truly a multidisciplinary department, but many of our courses actually go between single disciplines. And then final slide basically shows you where our graduates are working. And again, we've got a wide variety here. Um, some people have set up their own businesses, but many of them are working for large Japanese companies but also for the government, of course, and some have gone on to academia and had very, have, are having very good careers here. And that's all what I want to say. Um, we welcome you to as a major, as a second major, but of course also following on what you get in the first Asian studies module um, as a minor, um, sort of if you get interest in Japan, just try it out. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Henrik. I, I, I really appreciate you highlighting the fact of how uh, your graduates are really engaged in so many industries in business, airlines, government, academia. And I think this is something that we see across the board in Asian studies. Uh, there is perhaps a perception uh, that runs among students that what are we going to do with a major in Asian studies uh, uh, in, in a particular area like Japanese studies and elsewhere. And, and, and one, uh, this is uh, really uh, uh, what we have found, in fact, that our students' uh, uh, nuanced understanding of Asia uh, and its regions uh, come into use in a variety of sectors and indeed is, is, is a tremendous value add for them uh, in terms of their career tra trajectories in time to come. Now, with that, I, I guess, uh, since we are also uh, running a little short of time, I, I want to move on to Irving and, and, and something contemporary. Uh, and, and perhaps as a hook, I can ask him um, to introduce Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast Asian Studies Department, uh, and as well to talk about why uh, of late and especially in 2020 we had protests in Thailand and this is a common feature uh, of course it's happening in Thailand it's happened uh, uh, in it's happening in Myanmar right now and also in India so perhaps with that uh, uh, Irving uh, you can begin by telling us about Southeast Asian studies right uh, thanks Rajesh um, so I'm going to start off with just giving you guys some bad news. Um, we cannot travel to Thailand anytime soon. The Thai government has made it very clear that <laughs> we are not welcome yet, um, which has affected a lot of Singaporeans, right? Because the rise of budget airlines has meant that, you know, thousands of Singaporeans go to Bangkok um, over the weekend on each day, actually. Um, but all that has come to a standstill. And yet at the same time, if you guys remember last year, I think when it started, I mean, it's, it kind of built up, right, the protests in Bangkok. Um, and at first, the, the protesters, which were these young university educated, uh, they were undergrads primarily, right, from like the top universities in Bangkok, um, especially in the social sciences. It seems like they always kind of the difficult ones. Um, and so they were pushing for more democracy and, and kind of getting rid of the military dictatorship that is um, kind of structuring the Thai government right now. But the interesting thing that happened was there was a shift, right, towards like, I think it was like November, October, November, when we see teenagers joining in the protests. Um, and these are students in high school, um, and they came out with all sorts of reasons to protest. Um, they were against the uniform culture. In Thailand, all schools have to wear uniforms, and everybody has to have the same haircut. Um, and so they were against that. They saw that as an infringement of their, you know, their own identity. Um, and then, 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 then they dropped the bombshell because then it became about the king and how the king was not filling his role as an ideal Thai Buddhist monarch. Okay, so that's in a nutshell, right? Those protests are still going on in Bangkok sporadically now, not as bad as what a few months ago. 
Um, but to tie it to what Professor Hendrik Meyer talked about, um, COVID was one of the big kind of instigators in this because who are these kids, right? These are university students. These are students in top colleges and high schools who are really worried for the future of their jobs, right? And then at the same time, they are tied in, they're sucked into a global culture that's not just about being Thai, but being a global citizen. Um, the world impacts on how they see the world, right? And I'm gonna use that as a launch pad to talk about Southeast Asian studies because if you guys are familiar with what's going on in Myanmar right now, um, you know, there are all these protests um, because Aung San Suu Kyi was arrested um, and people are out on the streets protesting and people have died um, under the military crackdown. The Thai protesters in Bangkok, right, are looking to Myanmar now and everybody is doing this sign, both in Thailand and in Myanmar, right? There's a lot of cross-cultural um, you know, sharing, I would say, right? Um, and this is this is where our department, this, this is kind of the focus of our department, Southeast Asian Studies. Um, Rajesh, can we have the next slide? Because we look at Southeast Asia as a region not of individual countries per se, but of interconnections. And these are interconnections that go back historically, right? And that span Southeast Asia beyond the region. We look at connections between Southeast Asia and India, which has been going on for thousands of years, um, with China, with Europe, um, you know, this kind of global Southeast Asia, right? So if you, if you launch out from the protests in Bangkok, what you understand is, yes, it's a contemporary phenomenon affecting a bunch of very disgruntled and scared and nervous young people, right? But this is something that has a very strong kind of historical legacy, both in Thailand and within the region itself. The classes we do, like the protests amongst the students, right, is multifaceted, right? There's no one reason why these students are protesting, just as there's no one Southeast Asian Studies class. We have classes in anthropology, history, art, history, music, politics, in the list is right there, you can see it. Um, and it's very much like Japanese studies, Chinese studies, um, Malay studies, South Asian studies, where it's multidisciplinary, right? So you choose your trajectory. You know, a student could be interested in history and can take classes that are more historical like that. But classes in the Department of Southeast Asian Studies focus on interconnections between different ideas, between different, um, different disciplines, right? And we are the, I think we're the only department that offers dance <laughs> and, and art um, for the, yeah, there you go, for people who are, you know, more artistically inclined and a bit more marginal to the mainstream. Um, we have spaces for you. Um, <laughs> Pre-COVID, we know we, we bring our, our students out on field trips, and that was one of the big selling points for Southeast Asian Studies, because it shows many, you'll be surprised, you know, like Rajesh, I mean, NUS, many of the students don't know that they are in Southeast Asia. <laughs> they don't realize that Singapore is Southeast Asia. Um, and I asked this question in my, my SE 101, right? The introduction to Southeast Asia module. I said, are you guys in Southeast Asia? Oh, no, 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 no. Why? Oh, uh, Prof, we don't have paddy fields. We don't have poverty. We, we don't have protests on the streets. I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, so field trips are integral. And we hope to get these started again after we all get our injections. Um, and Thailand opens up whenever that is. Um, but that's one of the um, core um, aspects of the department. Um, yeah, you know, we have a good website. You could go to the website and if you want to find out the nitty gritties about classes that you have to take. Um, like the other Asian studies, we also emphasize language training, um, but you don't need to have a Southeast Asian language to start Southeast Asian studies. We teach you from scratch. All right? Okay. All right, thanks so much. Thanks, thanks, Irving. Uh, you know, uh, you'll be really happy to know that a number of uh, students who are interested in Southeast Asian studies end up at South Asian studies because they have the impression that South Asian studies is actually uh, looking at Southeast Asia in some way or another. Uh, well, of late, we have some courses that cross those disciplinary lines as well. 
But I think the wider issue that, that I, I want to uh, emphasize is the fact that by their very nature, area studies uh, fits into the CHS paradigm because of its multidisciplinary uh, nature and indeed uh, moving towards uh, interdisciplinary lines as well. Um, I want to go on and not to suggest that protests are the only things that are happening uh, in Asia, but it's important. I think it's really telling us something of the tremendous change that Asia is going through and the kind of implications that it's having on its people that is giving rise to protest in many parts. And, and, and with that, I, I, I want to begin uh, my uh, presentation on South Asian studies with protests that, that are going on currently uh, in Delhi and, and on its outskirts and, and also in some other parts of India as well, uh, massive farmer protests. Um, now here we have an image of Rihanna and Rihanna is tweeting and Rihanna is tweeting, why aren't we talking about this? And, and she's got an image of farmers' protests uh, that are happening in India. Now it begs really a couple of questions. Then you have responses uh, from um, popular personalities within the Indian context and elsewhere um, who are, are really critical uh, that, uh, of Rihanna for bringing this issue up. But it begs a couple of questions that, 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 that I want to uh, talk about a little. Firstly, uh, why are these farmers protesting? B, why is Rihanna tweeting about this? Um, now, I think this is not really the forum where I'm going to provide you a full answer to this. Uh, perhaps the farmers protests need to be understood in terms of the new laws that the state has undertaken to seek to reform the agricultural sector uh, in India. Uh, this is a massive sector, right? Uh, it accounts uh, about 50 to 60% of the Indian population is in some way involved in farming. Maybe as farmers, sometimes as marketers of goods and so on and so forth, but 50 to 60% of the population. Uh, this is tremendously different from the West or uh, the US where perhaps two and a half, three percent, four percent of the population is engaged in, in farming. Or even in China where about 25 percent of the population is engaged in. So these reforms are necessary, but they in many ways uh, threaten uh, the livelihoods of such a huge segment of the population. And what, what are the concerns here? The concerns are that farming will be cooperatize over time, that the kind of subsidies that exist are in some ways going to be taken away uh, to, uh, and, and will affect them. Uh, on Rihanna and, and her tweets, I, I think what I'm trying to mark out here, that what's happening in South Asia is really not something that is limited to South Asia, something that extends well beyond. It's noticed by a global audience. And indeed the protests that are happening in India are also occurring in uh, Canada, in UK and elsewhere because of the existence of a diaspora of a large diaspora of South Asians in this site. And now with that, let me introduce very quickly South Asian studies. Uh, uh, this are uh, some images of our students and, and it has an image of an open house. So if you were not attending this online, you would actually be getting treats in, in our usual open house here. Uh, we, we often provide you with treats. I'm afraid you'll have to um, just uh, be, uh, well, for now, at least you'll just have to look at the image and, 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 and discover what you're missing. Uh, what is it about? It's about the study of eight countries uh, that make up uh, really what is sometimes called the Indian subcontinent, uh, the countries of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, and Maldives. Now, people sometimes don't understand the size of this. This is 2 billion people. This is uh, really more than a quarter of the world's population, right? And, and 
we try and make sense of this uh, again in a multidisciplinary fashion. We look closely at religion and culture. Many of our modules are focused on that history, politics, environment, gender, and so on and so forth. So these are some of uh, our areas of focus uh, within this field. I want to give you a sense of the kind of modules as well that are offered. And indeed, these types of modules are available in many other uh, Asian studies programs as well. Uh, so some of our modules include uh, uh, as a kind of gateway, Discover South Asia. Uh, we have modules on Bollywood. We have modules on love, sex, and marriage in South Asia. Uh, a number of courses on uh, aspects of culture um, and religion, uh, including Islam and Sikhism. Uh, and we also have courses on international relations and politics, uh, as you can see uh, from this list that we have. Now, how can a student do South Asia? And, and, and in this, uh, I think it extends to the other Asian studies modules as well. You can major in it uh, with honors. You can do a second major in South Asian studies. You can minor in Indian studies. Uh, you, our students and every single major of ours is, is rendered uh, or provided an internship. We find this extremely valuable and useful uh, in enhancing their career prospects in time to come. Um, you have, of course, unrestricted electives, general education, field studies, and so on and so forth. So these are the various ways that you can do South Asian studies at CHS. And I think that the, the, the representation that I'm making of South Asian studies extends to every other area studies field. So you can do it uh, in these various ways. Now, before we close off our presentation and go on to deal with this question, I want to introduce you to two other elements. The first is um, a shared, uh, and it's part of the core curriculum of the College of Humanities and Sciences. Uh, this is the Asian Studies core module called Asian Interactions. Uh, and indeed, it brings together uh, different regional studies, and we also look closely at Singapore, we deal with this module with a variety of issues very pertinent uh, to the study of Asia. Uh, ethnicity and religion, for example, social inequalities, and, and you can see that in how it's giving rise to the protests that, that we are looking at, uh, diasporas, migration, um, and so on and so forth. So these are some of uh, the many disciplines that are brought together within the Asian Studies core module. And when you join CHS, then this will be uh, a module uh, that will be part of your core curriculum. Now, the other way that you can do Asia, and perhaps you may want to major in mathematics or, or some other field, uh, even in the sciences, but you have a deep interest, in, and, and I, I assure you that many of you will find uh, many of these Asian studies courses quite interesting. Uh, one other way of uh, in which you can do Asia is really to take up a minor in Asian studies. And all you need to do over the course of uh, your student life uh, at CHS is to do five uh, minor, uh, uh, five modules in Asia. Uh, so this is jointly offered by all the five Asian studies uh, departments. Uh, it provides uh, critical awareness of Asia through, uh, again, a multidisciplinary lens. Um, and if you do these five modules that are within this list of recognized modules, and it will be a quite an extensive list drawn from uh, the different departments, uh, you will be able to get the minor in Asian studies. Now, with that, I'm, I'm bringing to, end, to an end the official presentation, but it's a great time for me to take up some of the questions that you've posed. Um, and, and and here they are. I, I know there was one an earlier question on Japanese studies uh, and, and what it offers. I believe it's already been answered by uh, Professor Hendrik. Now the question here is, won't taking two majors and two CCAs take a lot of time? How do you manage your time? <laughs> I think we should ask a student this question. Uh, I think taking two majors is not uh, any longer an issue. Uh, 
Okay, so I, uh, I know that students have to plan their timetable quite carefully, uh, but you, I, we find that a number of students who do Asian studies uh, do it as a second major, uh, in addition to a particular, uh, uh, another area that they may have in mind, right? And in some ways, it adds tremendous value to the degree that you bring up. Uh, now there's a question here. I, I hope I've answered that. I don't know about the CCAs. Uh, I, 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 I think uh, um, uh, those should be done as well. After all, what is university if you do not also engage in a number of CCAs in your time? Um, is Asian studies a separate course from global studies or a subset? And, and, and perhaps I can ask any of my colleagues to take it up. Henrik, do you want to answer this? Yeah, I can answer this. Um, of course, yeah, we are, we are a separate program, um, but actually what happens is because Global Studies is not a department, but offered by colleagues and other departments from across the faculty um, that a lot of the, 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 basically the modules that we offer in the Asian Studies departments counts also towards the Global Studies students. So I'm always very happy to also see Global Studies students in our <laughs> module. I think that sort of answers it. Um, of course, there are some overlaps here, um, but generally these are is a separate degree. Um, though you might be able now, but it's a bit easier in the new college structure to actually do two majors and some combination might actually make a lot of sense if you're really interested in international issues. Indeed, I would say that a uh, number of global studies, uh, uh, global studies at least recognizes a number of Asian studies modules. Uh, as well. Uh, so, um, you know, it's great, as you mentioned, that a number of students from global studies actually uh, end up in our uh, classroom. Um, are uh, there any more me? questions? I think there was one question on Chinese studies. Uh, perhaps, Chang Wei, you wanted to take that? Okay, so uh, actually, I can then go back to the, to the earlier questions on global studies. Actually, okay, Chinese, yes? uh, sure. Chinese studies has a, a structured double major uh, okay. with global studies. Right, so uh, this is something that maybe you could also explore. And then the other question is around how to choose between Chinese studies and uh, Chinese language. As I said, uh, Chinese studies is about the study of the history, thought, uh, literature, and then Chinese language is about the language itself. But I mean, we do offer a kind of a CHCL structured double major, right, which only requires the student right, to overlook a little bit. Like I mean, in the in the I mean in the old systems, you'll be like uh, there's will be only any uh, only a, a, a and we'll overload of one module, right? Because they, we can have a lot of double count, right? Uh, but we are, we are now uh, transiting into this uh, CH new CH, CHS model, right? So everything is not fixed yet, right? But I, uh, as long as you do a, a, a structured double major with us, uh, the, assurance, the assurance is that uh, you will not uh, uh, overwhelmingly increase right, your workload. Okay, okay. Um, it, there's a third question, I think it's an important one because it deals with our minor in Asian studies that we share. Uh, and here the anonymous attendee asks, if I take a minor in Asian studies, do I need to study all Pi Asian studies or do I need to do just one? Well, you uh, doing one is not enough. Uh, so <laughs> we have a requisite within our minor in Asian studies where we require you to do at least modules that cut across uh, at least two, uh, if not three departments. Um, if you do uh, focus in your five modules on a particular department, you could, for example, get a, a minor in Chinese studies or a minor in Southeast Asian studies. But it, for the minor in Asian studies, you are required to do it from more than one department. Uh, so in this way, we want the student who's doing the minor in Asian studies to have a certain breadth. Uh, and so that he will do modules, for example, from Japanese studies and Malay studies uh, as well. Uh, you also have an option of uh, recognizing some language uh, uh, languages at the introductory level uh, that can be counted for within the minor. So uh, this is how we have tried to shape this minor uh, to ensure that uh, it, there is some breadth uh, that the student uh, takes. Okay. Uh, Okay, Prof. Hendrik, for you, uh, to what extent does Japanese studies offer um, the Japanese language and could I use JLPT system? Does JS offer N1, N2 Japanese language modules? 
Okay, Henrik, I don't know exactly uh, the, the technicalities, but you might be able to answer this better. Okay, I try to answer this as quickly as possible. Um, actually, language classes are offered by our language center, um, but we, of course, recognize their classes, and part of the language classes counts towards our degree. Um, I think at the moment, if you take up to our highest level, you might, it might be more than N1, N2 than the N1 level. So the, but we have a lot of students who after exchange in Japan and maybe some additional studies actually manage to pass the N1 qualification. Um, actually, Japanese companies, when they hire for their headquarters in Tokyo, often are looking for N2 and then expect people to reach the highest level, the N1 level, slightly later after they have been in Japan for some time. So, and I, so I think we offer quite a good language education not to the absolute highest level, but to a pretty high level. Okay. Um, okay, there's a, another question here on mother tongue language bonus points. Um, does it affect the modules I take? Uh, does, does this uh, really uh, constrain you in some way in terms of the modules you have to take when you join CHS? And Changwei, do you want to weigh in on this? And uh, yeah, actually, I'm, 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 I'm typing the answer. <laughs> oh, okay, right. but uh, uh, just speak. tell us all, please. Okay, so uh, under the old systems, right, uh, you need to like, read seven modules. I think it's the same for uh, 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 Chinese studies, uh, South Asian studies, and also uh, Malay studies, yes, studies. right? Yes. Uh, so, uh, but I'm not sure if the new system starting next year right, will have any impact on the number of modules that okay. one could, uh, one must take. Uh, okay. So I'm not sure Rajesh or uh, Norman has any insights into I, this. I believe that this uh, particular issue is being looked at very closely. I think there will be some, uh, so uh, I think in comparison to the previous demands, uh, the use of MTL points uh, will still require you to do. So for example, if you have used MTL points from uh, taking Tamil language, for example, and you want to use that for entry, uh, it will mean uh, that you'll have to take a set number of South Asian modules, but you do not have to, you don't need to take as many as you did previously. So I think the, the requirement has actually been reduced in the context of CHS. I think with the recognition that, uh, that the core module will, will take up. Uh, quite a number of points, but I think we are also waiting uh, for finalization on this particular matter. Nurman, is there anything else you want to add on this? No, not really. I, I think we need this need to finalize the, the issue, as you said. I think um, once the details have been finalized, you can find the information on our website on okay. Malay studies as well. Yes, we, we will all do that. Okay. Are there any other questions uh, for us? There is one here, right, on history, art, and culture of East Asian countries. Is it recommended to take history or one of the Asian studies degree? Maybe Irving can answer that for us. Yeah, <laughs> Irving, uh, it says, if I'm interested in history, art, and culture of East Asian or Asian countries, is it recommended to take history or one of the Asian studies degrees? Irving, what do you think? Hey, we can't hear you, Irving. You've got to uh, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, Irving. Yeah. All right. So I think if I were you, right, um, it, you know, I would do, if, if I'm interested in East Asia or if I'm interested in South Asia or Asian art in particular, right, I would do Asian studies because I think that actually covers a lot of the basis. Because if you do history, then you end up doing art history as one specific um, discipline, right? But if you're interested in art, design, et cetera, et cetera, then if you do Asian studies, you actually can cover a wider um, ground. And I think that actually produces better scholarship, if you ask me. And you'll probably have more fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Of course, a completely unbiased view there. From, totally unbiased. Uh, Professor totally Wing unbiased. <laughs> Okay, uh, Chang Wei, there's another question for you. Is there any Taiwanese uh, student? Oh, did you answer oh, that just, already? Yeah, I just answered it. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> okay, doing graduate studies. Okay, what yeah. else do we have here on the Asian studies net? Let me see. Uh, 
while we still have time, I think we have another 10 minutes. Um, is there any other issue that you think um, I may have missed out on that, that you think we, we should reflect upon uh, in, for our students? Anybody? Kick in. Actually, I just want to add something to that question on the Asian countries, right? Mm. Um, one question that we get a lot after the orientation talks, right, um, for both for poly students and for students entering FASS, um, are students who are interested in a particular country rather mm. than a region. So yeah. I've had student, students come up to me and say, oh, I'm really interested in Thailand, or I'm really interested in Indonesia, um, or I'm really interested in Japan, um, but I'm not really interested in the region per se. Um, so what should I do, right? So our recommendation or my recommendation for them is still like what I said, right? You do an Asian studies program because it allows you to understand your, the country that you're interested in in relation to broader issues. Um, in because the countries always exist in relation to other countries, right? So in order to understand what's happening in India, I mean, you should know what's happening in, in you know, countries around it, right? So that was my take. Okay, uh, I, I think uh, on the issue of um, doing history or East Asian and, uh, or whether you want to do Asian studies or not, I think one of the things that you will recognize as a student when you enter CHS and, and as you enter the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences is the, uh, that the tremendous expertise on Asia exists in Asian studies, but also beyond it. Uh, within our, our our fraternal departments, in like the Department of History, the Department of Politics, uh, and the Departments of Sociology. Indeed, many of our uh, members of staff, uh, our faculty members, uh, in fact, may actually uh, straddle both these departments. So Norman, for example, is both in Malay studies, but he's also in sociology. Uh, so you'll find that that ex expertise in Asia uh, extends quite a bit, uh, which means that in this process of studying Asia, uh, of course, uh, you know, I, I hope to see you in those classes, but you can also do this uh, in, 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 through uh, many of the disciplines uh, that you might be interested in. Okay. Um, Okay, anything else here? Okay, hello, good afternoon. May I know what are the possible job prospects for a South Asian Studies graduate? So yes, excellent question. Um, now, Henrik has already laid a basis of what happens to a Japanese studies student. Uh, let me tell you where my students are, okay? So I've, uh, my earliest batch, and we don't have very many majors. Uh, historically, uh, it has, uh, tended to be a five to seven majors in any given year. Um, so it's a small department. It's pretty warm department as well. So uh, we kind of guide our students right through their journey. Uh, so where are our students? Uh, so my earliest, and I've been in the department now for 19 years, uh, our earliest majors are in MINDEF, uh, in uh, various sect uh, public sector uh, areas so you know they could be diplomats they are in mindev uh, and then we've had uh, of course many who've gone into academia one year we had a graduating batch uh, and i can tell you that uh, uh, out of our uh, for about seven majors that year four entered the ministry of home affairs and i was wondering why it happened to be the year after the little india riots uh, so the Ministry of Home Affairs suddenly took in loads of South Asian studies. Graduates. But, but it's just not just the government sector. Um, of course, many businesses are looking at expertise uh, and consultants who have specialization in South Asia. And the thing is, it's a supply demand issue. The supply is small, the demand is growing. And so we have a situation in which I don't uh, have any graduate uh, that I know of uh, who's out of job, at least out of their own volition. They might not be in a job because they are on holiday, but that's a different matter. <laughs> okay, 
what is the difference between global studies and Asian studies? I think we have tried to uh, take that up. Uh, global studies is a separate program. Irving, do you want to reiterate on this particular issue again? No? No, I think we explained it. It's pretty self-explanatory. I mean, there are two very different um, departments. And as what Professor Hendrik Meyer has said, um, they are separate, but we do have some um, interactions between yeah, some of the modules in global studies, uh, they recognize Asian studies modules. Uh, so, but but of course, it's there's a, it's a separate major, right? Uh, yeah, may I say? Okay. Pardon? Yeah, maybe I just say, so global studies basically looks at international relations. It's more politics, economics. And um, so what the Asian studies do is they often combine that also with a more stronger cultural and historical topics. So we are actually broader in what we do. Um, we also do the international relations and the politics and business, um, but we also add to that culture, even popular culture. So we might be a little bit broader here. The Global Studies program is a much more focused program on international issues. That's right. I, I think that is really our intention, uh, that a major in Asian studies develops that nuanced multidisciplinary understanding of a region, right? A person who can, who has an appreciation of the cultural, uh, of the religious, of economics, of politics. And so that when that student is trained in with that uh, and, and deals with an issue in regard to Asia, will bring those different disciplinary perspectives together. Okay. Uh, can I get an idea of how many students are Japanese studies majors on average per intake? Henrik? Yeah, I think we have about 15 to 20 every year. And this is actually a very good number for us because we can take care of those students and, and send them on all the immersion programs we have and also make sure that they will get a, at least a half a year at a Japanese university. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Prof. Rai and our esteemed panelists. Um